Good evening and welcome to our weekend breakthrough prayer and weekend worship service. Today, I want to speak about what Christ brings to us. And I want to focus on two things, two areas that Christ brings to us, which is reconciliation and peace. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. I'm reading from verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the empty, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. My dear friends, we just saw Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. But I just want to give you an overall picture. In verses 11 to 22, the Apostle Paul wants the reader to grasp what God has done for man from three points of view. The first view that Paul is wanting us to look at is the historical view. Before Christ, God dealt with men through the Jewish nation. Since Christ, God has been moving on a worldwide scale to include both Jews and Gentiles who are willing to follow Christ. God takes both Jew and Gentile believers and he makes them the citizen of this new race, his new nation, his new creation. Next is an individual view. The Jewish nation was made up of individual Jews and the Gentile nations are made up of individual Gentiles. Therefore, God deals with each single person even as he deals with the Jewish nation and with the corporate nations of the Gentile world. And thirdly, it's from a new creation view. God is no longer dealing with divisions of nations. He's dealing with a new group of people, a new body of people who make up the true citizens of his kingdom. These citizens are individuals from all the nations of the world who now approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ. God promised to spiritually recreate any person who approaches him through Christ. And God causes that person to be born again. He makes a new man out of him. And God further promises the new man that he will become a member of God's new body he will become a member of God's new nation of people, his true church. It is these believers, those who believe in Christ, who are to constitute the true family of God and who are to inhabit the new heavens and earth, which God is to create in the future. My friends, the present passage is one of the most wonderful passages in all of scripture. Remember what life is like since Christ came. We have reconciliation and peace. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision 
by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The point I'm trying to make is this. We were far off and separate from, separated from God. I want you to note that Paul addresses the second person here. He says, you. He is referring to the Gentiles. That is, to everyone who was not a Jew. Glance at the words far off in verse 13. That means there was a time when all of us who are Gentiles were far off and we were separated from God. There was a time when great division separated us from heaven. And when was this? Before Christ. Before Christ, there was a great gulf, a great distance that separated most of the world from God. And this is the discussion of these two verses. And they basically, there are six things that kept us from God. And I want you to take note, the same six things keeps a man from God today. Firstly, we were barricaded from God by the Jews. God himself had caused the Jewish nation to be born of Abraham. He had challenged the Jews to be missionary, to be the missionary force to the world, proclaiming that he and he alone was the only true and living God, and that he was going to send the Messiah to save the world. But the Jews failed in their mission. They became exclusive. They became super spiritual. They became prideful and boastful in their religion. And they failed to reach out to the other people of the world. They took their own name, Jews, and called themselves by that name. But they classified everyone else in a package by the name of Gentile. They took the major ritual of their religion, circumcision, and called themselves by that name. But then everyone else, they called uncircumcised. The point is that we as Gentiles, we were barricaded from God by religion. A religion that had known the truth, but had allowed itself to become corrupted. My friends, I want you to understand this evening. Religion can keep a man from God, a corrupted religion. We must be on guard to protect the truth of Jesus Christ from corruption. Secondly, we were without Christ. This means that we as Gentiles neither knew nor expected the Messiah. That is the anointed one of God. As Gentiles, we had no hope of the coming savior for the world. Thirdly, we were aliens from God's people, that is from Israel. This means that we as Gentiles were not citizens of God's people, nation of people, being built by God for himself. As Gentiles, we had no destiny. Fourthly, we were strangers from the covenant and promises of God. This means that we as Gentiles, we were not the covenant people of God. God did not approach the Gentiles directly with the covenant relationship. The Jews alone had a covenant relationship with God. The fifth thing is this, we had no hope. As Gentiles, we lived in all the fears, the anxieties of life, and we were in constant expectancy of death. We had no hope of a life beyond this world, beyond human history. And finally, we were without God in the world. This means we as Gentiles stood alone in this world. We had no source of strength or hope beyond that which we ourselves could muster or which others like us could provide. 
there was nothing to which we could look beyond ourselves. We had gods, many, and lords, many, but we were alienated from the only living and true God. Let's continue. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Let's look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The point I'm trying to make is this. Christ brings us near to God. The word but now is a forceful contrast. Christ Jesus has now come into the world. There was a time when he had not entered the world, a time when men were divided, a time when men were separated from God, a time when men were separated from each other. But now Christ has come to bring all men to God and to each other. And how does Christ bring us near God? I want you to take note how clearly and unmistakably scripture declares by the blood by the blood. It is by the blood of Christ that men are brought near to God. But why the blood? Why was it necessary for Christ to die in order to bring us near God? There are two reasons. Firstly, man was estranged from God. Man had rejected and rebelled against God. Man had committed high treason against God. Man was working all kinds of evil and injustice in the world, all against the will and law of God. And even as the case is among men, the penalty for high treason and insurrection is exile and separation or death. My friends, I want you to know there was only one way men could ever be brought back to God. That is, if God loved him enough to forgive his transgressions, if God, was, if God loved him enough to forgive his rebellion, the glorious gospel is that God did love men that much. God was willing to forgive men. However, there was one problem. The judgment of exile or death had already been pronounced and the Lord's word could not be revoked. So what could God do? Only one thing. God had to provide a perfect ideal man for men. A man who could stand as the pattern for all men. If he could provide the ideal man, then he could die for men and his death would stand for the death of all men. This God has done. God has loved man with a perfect love. A love so strong that he was willing to substitute his son for man. Only God and God's son could love that much. This is the first reason Christ had to die, to shed his blood for man. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the word of God says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Secondly, God wanted to show just how much he loves the world. No greater love can a man give than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. However, God has gone much further than just giving his life for his friends. I want you to note this point. We were not friends of God. We were enemies in rebellion against him, rejecting him and rejecting every righteous laws of his. Therefore, when Christ died, he died for men who were without strength. When Christ died, he died for men who were ungodly. When Christ died, he died for men who were sinners. When Christ died, he died for men who were enemies. You know, Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Again in Romans 5 verses 8 to 10, scripture says, 
but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's get back to our main scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 14 to 15. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Christ brings us peace. I want you to take note that Jesus Christ himself is our peace. Christ brings us peace when we realize that he died for us. And he offers us deliverance from the bondage of sin and death and a life of eternity with God. Christ brings a deeper sense of peace when we realize that he gives the daily power to overcome the aggravating and terrible weight of anguish and guilt and loneliness and loneliness and fear. Christ brings a deeper sense of peace when we realize that he has brought perfect love and unity to the world that he has eliminated all divisions and barriers and differences between God and man and, and between men. The first point I want to bring is this. Christ brings, brings peace by bringing men together as one. My friends, he had made both one, that is Jew and Gentile. And there are two ways that Christ makes men as one. Firstly, all men now approach God on the same basis, on an equal footing, and that is by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Therefore, when a man comes to the cross, he comes with everyone else who is standing at the feet of Jesus. He stands as one with them, all on an equal basis. Sinners who need a savior. Standing there, he is not accepted by God because he is better, healthier, wealthier. Just because you are more intelligent, more capable, and more religious than anyone else doesn't mean you can approach God or you are acceptable to God. But we are acceptable to God because we acknowledge our unworthiness and nothingness. Our desperate need to be saved by the blood of Christ. We are acceptable to God because we acknowledge that He is all he, that, 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 that when we accept that we are all the same. We are all lost, we are all in need, and we come as one with all other men to confess Christ as our Savior. Secondly, all men who come to Christ for salvation receive a common love, a common purpose, common work. First, there is the common love. Every believer who comes to Jesus Christ loves him. And that common love among believers tears a common love between believers. Love for Jesus Christ tears love for all those whom Christ loves, which is everyone. Christ leads men to love one another. Secondly, there is the common purpose and work, that of living a righteously and bearing testimony to the glorious message of salvation and to life eternal. The second point is this, Christ brings peace by breaking down all barriers. Now, this is a picture taken from the temple. The temple was surrounded by a series of courts. Each court had a high wall separating it from the preceding court. As one approached the temple, he entered first of all the outer court of the Gentiles. This is where the buying and the selling of animals and the exchanging of money for foreign worshippers took place. 
Then there was the court of the woman. A Jewish woman was limited to this court unless she had come to make a sacrifice. The next court was the court of the Israelites. This is where the whole congregation gathered on the great feast days and, and, and where sacrifices were handed over to the priests. Then we have the court of the priests. This court was in the temple proper where the temple itself stood. This area was considered sacred and was accessible only to the services of the priests. Finally, within the very heart of the temple stood the Holy of Holies or the most holy place where the very presence of God was to dwell. Only the high priest could enter the holy place and he could enter only once a year at the great Passover feast. Partition after partition separated people from the presence of God. Tablets hung around the wall of the Gentile court announcing that if any Gentile walked into any other court, he will be put to death. The picture is that of Jesus Christ breaking down all barriers. Jesus Christ breaking down all walls that separate men from God. All men can now approach God equally to the death of Jesus Christ. Men build all kinds of barriers and prejudices against other men. Society is plagued with barriers and prejudices built around such things as race, wealth, appearance, position, health, religion, morality, commitment, organizations, dress, ability. But Christ has now done away with all these things. He has broken them down by the blood of his cross. All men now approach God and become worthy on the same basis by bowing before the cross and surrendering their lives to God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, Christ brings peace by wiping out the enmity of the law against us. My friends, before Christ, men had to approach God through law. However, men discovered something. The law did not make him acceptable to God. It condemned him. It showed him how far away from God he really was. Totally depraved. Every time he broke the law, the law cried out guilty and pronounced the penalty of being imperfect and unworthy and unacceptable to God. Men discovered that the law was against him and enmity within at all times. But now Christ has done away with the enmity and the condemnation of the law. Remember, Christ lived a sinless life, fulfilling the law perfectly, and thereby he has secured the perfect and ideal righteousness. Christ has also paid the penalty for men's, for men's having broken the law. As the ideal and perfect man, he could do this. When he died on the cross, he bore our condemnation. He bore our punishment. The point I'm trying to make is this. When Christ fulfilled the law, he became the embodiment of the law. He is now the way. A man is to approach God through Christ, not the law. Therefore, there are no laws, no rules, no decrees to keep men from God. There's only one thing that keeps a man away from God. His refusal to come to God through his son, Jesus Christ. Fourthly, Christ brings peace by creating a new man. God planned and promised a new creation. The creation of a new man individually and corporately. A new man in whom Jesus Christ dwells. Individually, when a man turns to Christ, Christ causes the man to be born again. He recreates the man, creates the man all over again. The man has a new life now. He begins life all over again. He has a new beginning. And this new beginning brings peace, peace of heart and mind. Corporately in Jesus Christ, all men who believe, both Jew and Gentile, make up one new body one new family, one new building, one new temple, one new fellowship. Let's go on. Ephesians 2, verses 16 to 17. 
and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Christ brings us reconciliation. The word reconcile in the Greek means to change, to change thoroughly, to change from enmity to friendship, to bring together, to restore. The idea is that two persons who should have been together all along are brought together. Two persons who had something between them are restored and are reunited. And I, I want to give you five points about reconciliation. Five points. Number one, the thing that broke the relationship between God and man was sin. Men are said to be enemies of God, and the word enemies refers back to the sinners and the ungodly. The enemies of God are the sinners and the ungodly of this world. This simply means that every man is an enemy of God, for every man is a sinner and ungodly. And this may seem unkind and harsh, but it is exactly what scripture is saying to us today. The fact is clearly seen by thinking about the matter for a moment. The sinner cannot be said to be a friend of God. He is antagonistic towards God. He opposes what God stands for. The sinner is rebelling against God. He is disobeying God. He is rejecting God. The sinner is fighting against God, cursing God, denying God. The sinner is ignoring God. The sinner is refusing to live for God. When any of us sin, we work against God and promote evil by word and example. When the sinner lives for himself, he becomes an enemy of God. Why? Because God does not live for himself. God gave himself up in the most supreme way possible. He gave his only son to die for us. When the sinner lives for the world and he lives for worldly things, he becomes an enemy of God. Again, why? It's simply because he chooses to be temporal. He chooses the temporal things, things which pass away over God. Man chooses temporal things when God has provided eternal life for him through the death of his son. This is the point I'm trying to make, my friends. This is the point of God's great love and reconciliation. He did not reconcile and save us when we were righteous and good. He reconciled and saved us when we were enemies, when we were ignoring him, when we were rejecting him. As I said earlier, it is because we are sinners and enemies that we need to be reconciled. Secondly, the way men are reconciled to God is by that of his son, Jesus Christ. Very simply stated, when a man believes that Jesus Christ died for him, God accepts the death of Jesus Christ for the death of the man. When a man believes that Jesus Christ died for him, God accepts the sins borne by Christ as the sins committed by the man. When a man believes that Jesus Christ died for him, God accepts the condemnation borne by Christ as the condemnation due to the man. Therefore, the man is freed from his sin and the punishment due his sins. Christ bore both the sin and the punishment for the man. The man who truly believes that God loves that much, enough to give his only begotten son, becomes acceptable to God, reconciled forever and ever. Third point is this. God is the one who reconciles, not men. Men do not reconcile themselves to God. They cannot do enough work or they cannot do enough good to become acceptable to God. Reconciliation is entirely the act of God. God is the one who reaches out to men and reconciles them unto himself. Men receive reconcil reconciliation of God. Fourthly, all men can be reconciled to one another, can be brought together if they look up to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Men who look up to Jesus Christ for reconciliation and peace 
with God are linked arm in arm under the same Lord. And fifthly, men learn about reconciliation by the preaching of Jesus Christ. Christ was the first to preach the message. His followers are to follow in his train. For there's no other way men can ever know that they can be reconciled to God apart from preaching. Ephesians 2, our main scripture again, Ephesians 2 verse 18. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. The point I'm trying to make here is this. Christ brings us access to God. The word access in Greek means to bring to, to move to, to introduce, to present. The thought is that of being in a royal court and being presented and introduced to the king of kings. Jesus Christ is the one who throws open the door into God's presence. He is the one who presents us to God, the sovereign majesty of the universe. Note that it is the Holy Spirit who has caught us into God's presence. The idea is that of a daily access, hour by hour, moment by moment. The Holy Spirit keeps us in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the divine nature of God within us that gives us permanent access into God's presence. The Holy Spirit is the one who works in us and tells us to move more and more into God's presence. The Holy Spirit is the constant companion with us, teaching us to live in God's presence. The Holy Spirit is the one within us who bears witness that we are children of God and we should approach God continually. My friends, I pray that you understand this great call of ours. I pray you understand the gift that Christ has given us. As we have accepted Christ, we are reconciled to God. As we have accepted Christ, we have peace. Let us pray. Merciful God, we celebrate the way that you chose to bring unity and peace to people. Through the gift of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He broke down long-standing walls of prejudice and hostility between Jews and Gentile. Hostility between man and female. Hostility between slave and freedom. He abolished rules that restricted life and replaced them with a new commandment to love as he did. Father, where have we gone astray? Walls of prejudice still exist and barriers of racism still hold people back from reaching their true potential. We hear the great message of Jesus reconciling people to you. Oh God, and to one another. And yet we still hesitate to reach out to people when they are different in some way from, in some way from us. Forgive us when we create barriers rather than tear them down. Jesus made us members of the household of God and he holds us together to the power of his spirit. Maybe it is because we like to do things the way that we have always done them that create barriers and exclude strangers, preventing them from ever having the opportunity to experience the reconciling power of Jesus in their lives. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to take risks for the gospel's sake. We remember with gratitude how people share their faith with us so that we are no longer strangers and aliens. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to bind us together in love and peace, building us up as a witnessing, welcoming and forgiving community of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To our friends on social media, we thank you for joining us. We will see you all next week. God bless you all. For those in the household, please hold on as we continue with the rest of our service. God bless.